Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Darsh Shah. And I'm Dr. Ultima Shraja. And welcome to Medicine Redefined. A podcast where we will explore the often overlooked but necessary components of health, what we consider to be the fundamentals. We will investigate topics and practices that can give you and your patients the best chance to optimize a healthy lifestyle. It's time to move the needle forward and put the health back in healthcare. Our guest today is Dr. Tufik Jilde. Dr. Jilde is an assistant professor at Michigan State University as well as team physician for Michigan State University Athletics and the U.S. Olympic Ski and Snowboard Team. He currently serves as a head team physician for Michigan State football and basketball. He specializes in sports medicine, joint preservation, cartilage restoration, and joint reconstruction of the shoulder, knee, hip, and elbow. In addition, he also serves as the chair of orthopedic research in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Michigan State University. Academically, Dr. Jilde has published more than 110 peer-reviewed manuscripts, book chapters, and abstracts. He has presented over 100 papers at conferences nationally and internationally. He has been the recipient of accolades such as the Odanio Sports Injury Award from the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, Best Clinical Research Award, and Best Resident Fellow Publication from the Arthroscopy Association of North America, as well as top research accolades from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, American Orthopedic Society, and American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. Dr. Jilde is committed to providing the most up-to-date, world-class care to patients. He is sensitive to the uniqueness and circumstances of each patient he meets, and he prides himself on individualized treatment for his patients. He aims to return patients back to optimal activity levels and will work with patients to meet their own goals. In this episode, we weave through multiple topics. We start by briefly discussing his background and inspiration for going down the pathway of orthopedics and sports medicine, but the bulk of this discussion is centered around his somewhat novel algorithm, if you will, for managing postoperative pain. Dr. Jill Day and his team have been at the forefront of publishing some incredible literature on how to effectively manage postoperative pain without the use of opioid medications. The opioid crisis has gotten quite a bit of attention and criticism, yet it's not something we've gotten a good handle on. TV shows like Dope Sick and multiple documentaries have highlighted the importance of getting a good understanding and control of this epidemic, but as a frontline provider who deals with this day in and day out, I can tell you the struggle still exists. As you know, the theme of this show is improving healthcare practices, and this is something that needs to be addressed immediately because opioid-related deaths have steadily increased over the last decade. Suffice it to say, this necessary conversation with Dr. Jalay has been a long time coming. The other big topic we get Tufik's take on is the role of a high-level team physician, but not in the sense that we've talked about before. Being a high-level team physician throughout his career, we were curious about his take on the longevity of elite athletes. These individuals subject themselves to the punishment, so to speak, for our entertainment and long-term consequences of unchecked trauma or toll, and how the culture of rest and recovery has changed over the past few decades. You know that we've emphasized that aspect multiple times. And considering all the different technological gadgets and wearables that help us pay attention to sleep, recovery, or even enhance these metrics at times, this might be an area that you are also paying attention to. So Dr. Jilde has some interesting perspectives regarding the longevity of the elite athlete that I think you'll find very interesting. Now, without further delay, please enjoy this episode with Dr. Tufik Jilde. Dr. Jilde, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Altamash. Um, I'm so excited for this conversation as we were speaking offline. Uh, we're both sports guys. And, you know, I I tell I work with a lot of med students and even trainees, and I'll often tell them, you know, if you're trying to find a provider or if you're trying to see if somebody's passionate about something, go read about what they're publishing on, right? So do a PubMed search, see what it is that they're writing about, and then you'll get a sense of what that person's passionate about. And so, of course, you know, when we were getting ready for this interview, I did that for you. And when you go on PubMed, you see that you're talking about biologics, you're talking about BFR, you're talking about um, you know post-operative pain management, you're talking about AI, and it's you know all over the place. And initially, I'm like, oh man, I can't really get a sense of this guy, uh, but it, it's also exciting because it, you know well, it tells me two things: one, you're probably an expert on several domain matters, um, and also that you have a wide range of interests. So um, I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, but with that, I also want to get a sense of you're an orthopedic surgeon by training and sports medicine specialist. What drew you to those two specialties particularly? Yeah, so early on, I realized that the field of orthopedics and more specifically sports medicine really allowed uh, physicians to restore form and function to many types of patients, you know, very young all the way to very old and allow them to perform the activities that they love uh, in a definitive way. And like I said, this is, you know, a young person, person performing at a very high level all the way to an older person, just simply trying to return to activities of daily living. 
And I personally really enjoyed the heterogeneous mix of patients. And uh, that required me as a physician to remain dynamic and adaptable. And, uh, you know, aside from that, I'm a pretty big sports geek. So it's pretty neat to be working with a population that, that I enjoy. Yeah, one of the things that, that you've worked a lot on recently is talking about pain management and post-operative pain, which is going to be the focus of the talk today, at the very least. Now, pain is something that we touched on, on a couple of times, at least from different aspects. Uh, but we haven't talked a lot about opiates. And at this point, narcotics, opiates, most people are familiar with that. What, where was your interest? Like, where did that start um, where you thought this was really important to touch on and, uh, and start writing about researching and, and start developing a couple of different randomized control trials for this? Yeah. So a little background about myself is I, I trained in Detroit for both medical school and residency. And I, and I noticed that many patients were coming in with abnormal amounts of pain that were refractory to normal pain control modalities that were available to us. And upon you know, studying this phenomenon, three facts became very evident to us. Number one, opioid prescriptions rose from 76 million in 1990 to 220, 20, 225 million in 2012. Uh, There's a six-fold increase in opioid-related deaths in that, during that time. And lastly, uh, orthopedic and spine conditions accounted for about 30% of opioid prescriptions in the U.S., and that many patients were introduced to opioids through, through uh, their orthopedic conditions became very evident to me that post-operative pain uh, remained one of the most challenging aspects of patient care for us as orthopedic surgeons, and that uh, there's actually quite a bit of data showing that many patients first were granted access to opioids through uh, orthopedic conditions, and that we are some of the largest pres prescribers of opioids. So in my mind, that made orthopedic surgeons uniquely qualified to play a role in uh, mitigating opioid prescriptions, and that's kind of what got me into this uh, interest uh, from an academic perspective. Yeah, you alluded to the the staggering rise in prescriptions, right? Seventy six million to two twenty five million. You said from nineteen ninety nine to two thousand twelve. I was looking at some some data earlier that I that I shared with Dars, just kind of the figures on just the the escalating numbers over the years. And what what is amazing about this is, you know, you look at the the, the drug related overdose and deaths um, among all ages from nineteen ninety nine and all the way up to 2021, and it's just a, a, a steep upslope, right? And what we've also learned that over the past couple of years, especially during the pandemic, that those numbers have actually doubled or tripled or increased even more rapidly. What was especially scary to me is I came across this figure that, that we're going to put in the show notes. Um, and I think this data is uh, showing that between the, between the years 2015 to 2021, there was an 8x increase between uh, for the number of involved overdose deaths from opiates specifically. And I think everybody who was in medical training early on has kind of just been hearing about the opiate crisis, right? There's a documentary that came out maybe two years ago called Dope Sick, right? There's a book after that. Everybody talks about how good it is. I haven't gotten a chance to see it yet. But anybody, and you know, you and I were at the same level of training in terms of when we graduated, um, anybody who's been going through training the last couple of years, we realized that we've been backpedaling. But what was interesting to me is that over the last like seven or eight years, the numbers of opioid related deaths are still increasing significantly. Do you think that that's, you know, a downstream effect of prescriptions still rising or because we're backpedaling prescriptions are being curtailed and, you know, patients or individuals who are high risk are going and looking for that, those illicit drugs? I think that's a great question. And I think with any significant policy change, there is a transient period, which I believe we're in now, where, uh, you know, the policy changes and there's a paradoxical increase while those patients who are already on these medicines are trying to seek out opioids right now. Um, and I think the policy changes that have been instituted uh, are good because as a result, there's fewer younger people uh, having access to, to opioid care. I think on a long-term basis that we'll notice that after this transient increase in opioids, there'll be a precipitous decline, but right now we're in a very tenuous period. Uh, Dr. Gelday, how much training do surgeons, you know, orthopedics typically get on opioids? You know, I mean, I can speak for Altamash and I, I mean, typically throughout PM&R, you do have a pain rotation um, where you might get some of that exposure, but are you kind of just thrown in and kind of learning on patients um, in that sense? Or is there a specific rotation where you actually do get the ability to kind of learn about the effects of opioids? 
Truthfully, Darsh, when I was training, there was no specific education on it. However, once I graduated, in concordance with the increased attention on opioids, I've noticed that there's been uh, mandates by many medical licensing boards that we have to take a, a course on it. And also, uh, in, in terms of the practice of medicine, I've also noticed that some of the mentors that many surgeons have now are more cognizant of, of this and are less likely to prescribe opioids in a higher amount. And, and that transformation was really evident even within my period of training from start to beginning or start to end rather. Gotcha. Yeah. And just to kind of highlight um, Altamash's point too about the uh, data that he was showing. I mean, I was pretty taken aback by, you just see this really sharp rise, like you were saying around 2015, 2019. Um, but now that we're seeing younger people not using it as much, um, are you seeing what are, what are you typically seeing with the opioids? Like there's other data points there that show that it's because of in conjunction with benzos, in conjunction with cocaine. Um, what type of things are you kind of worried about when you look at prescribing opioids for patients? Well, I think there's multiple confounders that can really uh, determine how, my, how many opioids a patient will need. Uh, you already referenced one of them, uh, namely polysubstance. I think that in... In concordance with the opioid crisis in the United States, there's also a big mental health, uh, you know, kind of wave going throughout the nation here. And it's not a coincidence that in many areas with poor mental health access, people are seeking help, whether it be from opioids, from drugs, or, or really even alcohol. And, uh, you know, in prescribing pain medicines and working up my patients, these are data points that, I, that I'm especially cognizant of, both formally and informally as well. So that's a good segue into talking about the biopsychosocial model. I think that this is something that's been brought up a couple of times and anybody who's in pain education now has heard this. And if not, definitely need to Google it. Uh, but essentially just for, for the, the listeners and especially the patients who haven't heard it, um, you know, I think for a long time, the biomechanical model or structural pathologies what people would worry about. So for instance, you come in and you have back pain, right? And then we get some imaging and we, we found out that uh, maybe you have some pathology like a disc herniation or something, and maybe you don't. Um, what we've learned over the years is that there's actually a poor correlation between the structural pathology and um, actual people's perception of pain specifically. And as you alluded to, there are so many other factors that go into pain, right? Like what's your background? What are What's uh, the state of your mental health? What is your socioeconomic status? Uh, what's your support system like? What in my experience and what I've learned over the last couple of years, just talking to people is we've done a lot better at understanding that psycho component of it, but I still think that we have a long way to go when it comes to the social aspect of it, right? So what's kind of your thought on that? And then how do you incorporate consider taking some of those things into consideration when you're building this individualized pain approach for your post-operative patients? Yeah, so I think that biopsychosocial model is really important, namely for the reasons that you delineated. It really emphasizes that pain is not a result of physiologic factors, but it's really heavily influenced by psychological and social aspects as well. So as part of my routine history and onboarding for any patients, I make sure that I really try to delineate uh, qual both qualitatively and quantitatively the patient's psychological and, and social situations. And, you know, importantly, and I think that you guys might find this really interesting, uh, at Michigan State, in our athletic department, we have many, uh, both social workers and psychologists on staff who are able to speak to our athletes after injury. And I try to leverage this model in the community uh, that I take care of, which includes Greater Lansing area, as well as Michigan and beyond, in that if I detect that a patient um, requires more from a psychological or social component, I, I have a heavy suggestion that they speak to one of these types of peoples that can help, uh, who, who are professionals that can help improve uh, my patient situations before we even address their, their structures surgically. I, I'd love to kind of now talk about this multimodal pain management approach that we've alluded to a couple of times. Would you care to chat a little bit about maybe some of the studies that you've done, from my understanding, at least you had four different um, pathologies that you looked at, right? Rotator cuff pathology, labral stuff, ACL, and is it meniscus? The last one looking at. Where where did you start out of all the different things? And then um, what was kind of the trajectory? And, and if you wouldn't mind talking about what that multimodal pain management included. Yeah. 
So let's backpedal here a little bit and talk about how this all started. So we left off uh, in Detroit, where I really identified a lot of patients having pain that was refractory. Um, so we identified this problem, myself and, and some of my mentors as a group. And what we did is we initially custom tailored a protocol to the human healing experiences, as you alluded to. The intention here was that we would target pain at multiple points to help mitigate it at its source, rather than just providing a single agent addictive opioid saying, here, here you go, just take this, you know, one or two pills every four to six hours. So we performed this in multiple steps. So phase one, we developed a case series of 141 patients. And this was a cohort of all those aforementioned surgeries together, ACL, meniscus, labrum, and rotator cuff. And we sent patients home with our non, uh, non-opioid protocol in a small dose of narcotics. So that was just 10 pills uh, to be only taken for emergencies. And we followed up on these patients. And we found that actually with our non-narcotic protocol, 45% of patients did not feel the need to take any of the emergency narcotics whatsoever. So that meant zero pills. And patients, of course, you know, had those pills at home lying around. They could have taken it whenever we wanted. So we were really impressed with these findings, and we decided to take it one step further and do four randomized controlled trials, comparing the gold standard of opioids uh, to our novel multimodal protocol. And uh, patients were randomized to either arm, whether it's our protocol or, uh, or opioids. And of course, patients could not be blinded to this because you know the, the non-narcotic protocol involved taking many pills, whereas the opioid uh uh, protocol mm-hmm. just involved taking one pill. It was the surgeons and practitioners that were that were blinded. And the thinking uh, behind these studies was that again we could target pain at multi multiple points in the pathway to mitigate pain at its source. And the protocols really involved. I suggest uh, any listeners you know look me up and check out those protocols. I'm going to have a web I have a website up that you guys can look that up. But essentially, for days one through five, patients will take toradol, gabapentin. Robaxin or methylcarbamol and acetaminophen at particular points during the day. Starting day six, Toradol is traded for meloxicam BID and gabapentin is weaned down in the following matter. So it's twice a day, day six, seven, once a day, eight, nine, and then none by day 10. And by that point, by day 10, pain can pretty effectively be uh, controlled just using over-the-counter Tylenol or NSAIDs. And this has been proven uh, effective for, for all those surgeries. Hmm. So uh, I kind of love this little cocktail, right? So for, for maybe another, just a background to give people, right? So I think something we've talked about with Patrick Fine and way back in the archives, right? We've kind of described different types of pain, right? We've talked about the nociceptive pain. We've talked about neuropathic pain. And typically when people are using gabapentin, it's more going to be a neuropathic pain, that nerve related pain, right? The, the radiating pain, shooting, tingling, pins and needles type situation, Tylenol, maybe can have a little bit of crossover effect for both methylcarbamol, as you mentioned, is more of a muscle relaxer. And then Toradol is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, very much in the class of ibuprofen, but a bigger gun than that. Um, other than these four, did you guys ever, while you were coming up with the, this protocol the very first time, did you play around with other combinations and settle on this ultimately to be the most successful? Or this was like a, a one and done type situation? Oh, well, great question. So what I did in researching this protocol is I pieced together all the literature, uh, looking at uh, medicines that were effective in decreasing opioid use for certain surgeries. And what I did is I took all these individual medicines that were proven to be effective in decreasing opioid use. And um, again, I, I corresponded each medicine to the healing cascade and when they would be most effective. Um, so I got really lucky, I would say the first couple of trials uh, were very effective. So I just stuck with that winning formula to begin with. Now, that's not to say that in the future, things can get refined more thoroughly. But again, the, the purpose of these studies was to prove in theory that we could operate on these patients and they don't need opioids whatsoever. I think this is a works in progress and certainly subject to more research to, to perfect this even more. What was I'm curious, what was the narcotic in the opiate group? It was Norco 5-325. That's hydrocodone, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I know you're familiar with biologics, right? So PRP, you talk about some of the cellular treatments. And as you're probably familiar, um, most of the PRP protocols and the post PRP protocols will suggest that we refrain from non steroidal anti inflammatories, right? Because they disrupt that healing response, which is what we want. Um, I'm curious, though, because there's also, I think, some evidence that suggests that, you know, non steroidal anti inflammatories will affect bone healing. Um, and certainly intended that kind of stuff. 
Um, do you think that, that that is something that we need to be concerned about, especially in the immediate post-operative phase when we want robust healing response? Or how do you think about that? I love that question, Altamash. And the reason is, is because there's been, for, first, let's start off on the history of those studies. Those studies proving that NSAIDs inhibit bone healing were based on the theoretical idea that, uh, you know, the inflammatory period when let's say after you break a bone or heal something, it's incredibly important, right? There's a huge inflammatory cascade and there's a theoretical idea that an NSAID would disrupt that inflammatory cascade. Uh, initial animal models that substantiated on that theory were, were provided these animals with super physiologic doses of NSAIDs, much more than we would provide, provide human beings. What's interesting is recent literature has kind of dispelled that as, as being true from, from the body of literature that I've seen. And certainly, uh, you know, one arm of our study that I'd like to look at in the future is proving that further that NSAIDs don't really affect healing more robustly uh, in that patients with my protocol uh, uh, don't have any interrupted healing. But back to the original question, I think that a lot of the original uh, studies proving that NSAIDs inhibit healing are kind of being dispelled with time. So as we talked about, I think it's been a couple of years since at least you published your, there, there have been at least a couple of years since the very first paper was published, right? And um, I know this has been presented on several um, at several national conferences, and you've been the recipient of some, some pretty prestigious awards. I'm curious how um, maybe in some of the orthopedic circles and the post-operative uh, management, how has this changed some of the best practices in orthopedic care for pain management in the post-operative phase? And maybe even... Um, you know, preoperative considering, I think that you, we talked about uh, briefly and, and certainly written about how the preoperative opiate use is a significant risk factor or predictor for postoperative, um, right, opiate use. So um, how has that worked out? So a lot of my initial studies were looking at predictors of opioid use after uh, surgery. And like you said, that was one uh, fact that was consistent throughout all my studies is that preoperative opioid use meant multiple, you know, factors of 10 more uh, uh, post-operative opioid use. So let's just start off there. Um, what's interesting is these studies have been provided to orthopedic surgeons as part of their board review uh, materials in terms of American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons. I provide this in my practice and I have patients in the community and beyond coming asking for this protocol post-operatively, particularly in the younger demographic that are really susceptible to being hooked on uh, narcotics. And actually, uh, what's interesting is I'm seeing this more and more on uh, surgeons' websites or uh, medical systems' websites, citing our papers in that uh, different systems are providing this as well. And I find this really exciting. And I, I find that uh, uh, these studies have actually uh, changed care on a macroscopic level. Dr. Jilda, I did, I did want to ask you, too, about your research. Um, you know, obviously, on PubMed, you've done different joints. You talk about shoulder. You talk about the knees. And oftentimes patients will come in, at least from what I've noticed, and say, oh, knee pain. I, I've, I've heard after surgery, that's the worst. It's even worse than shoulder or any other joint. Has that been the case? Have you seen that there's been more of a need for opioid or at least a uh, preconceived notion that patients will reach for more medication uh, depending on whatever joint that um, they have to go through for surgery? That's a great question. Uh, in my practice, no, I really haven't seen a dependence, uh, a variability in terms of their joint. And I think that's partially because in those patients that undergo surgery in my practice, a large number of them get preoperative and postoperative nerve blocks that really help kind of mask that pain during that acute uh, uh, perioperative period. Uh, so I think that uh, firstly, you know, to answer your question, no, I don't think there's any difference in terms of joints. And, and number two, I think it's, uh, you know, because of good, uh, you know, high tech medical care that a lot of patients might not notice these differences. Yeah, we really can thank our anesthesia colleagues there, huh? Certainly. But really, honestly, all sonographers, because I do a lot of those <laughs> in my clinic new. Um, but uh, but no, I, I love that stuff. You know, I'm I'm curious, you, you, of course, you're an orthopedic surgeon, you do a lot of surgical cases. But I think what a lot of the general population fail to realize, and even some of the medical trainees who are early in their training is, majority of musculoskeletal medicine is non-surgical by nature. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, I would. Yep. And I think maybe I'm just curious to get your take on this. What percentage of your patients that you see are surgical cases? So I heard a funny quote from my mentor, one of my mentors once, and he was talking about having a orthopedic surgery clinic. And he said that nationwide, a good uh, 
what would be considered a good or, or uh, you know, kind of an average number of patients that you see that turn into surgical patients are is 10%. Uh, and I, and I find that to be kind of consistent, uh, not just among my, uh, practice, but the practice of my colleagues as well. Yeah, that that's right on. That's I mean, one of my earliest mentors and oldest mentor was an orthopedic sports surgeon as well. And, um, and, and that's exactly what I was told and what I was taught growing up, if I can say, but you know, that begs the question is, you know, if 90% of what you're doing and hundred percent of what I'm doing is non-surgical in nature, musculoskeletal medicine. What are the lessons that we can take away from these protocols that you've been able to highlight that are so effective, right? How can we apply these to our non-surgical cases? Um, how have you done that? Uh, so, you know, one thing I've realized through my journey here, so to speak, is that there's many pain control modalities that that, that don't even require oral medications. And, and I think that's really important to counsel patients on. And these include simple measures such as elevation, cryotherapy, or, or simply icing, PT, massage, uh, yoga, and meditation to address the, the mental component. And, and it's important to be very systematic when addressing patients' pain, uh, whether they come in for a surgical issue or non-surgical issue. It's important to focus on the etiology pain and to really custom tailor your counseling and, and the patient's protocol to that etiology, whether that be muscle spasms uh, or a torn ACL or a broken bone. Um, you wrote a, a piece, an editorial, where I loved how you described kind of just the addressing the the global need, things that we've touched on in the first half of this discussion about how not only providers, but patients also need to kind of own their pain and providers need to acknowledge the magnitude of their pain. And only that way, if we can work together, can we get out of this mess, right? This opiate crisis, so to speak. How can How can patients own their pain? So with more analytical work being done on the healing cascade, I, I think that uh, we can control non-operative and, and post-operative pain better while circumventing the addictive burden altogether. And I, I encourage all your listeners, whether they're patients or, or medical providers and physicians themselves, to uh, really listen to what's going on with your patients. And, uh, you know, like I said, identify, be very systematic about the pain, whether you got to identify the reason why you're in pain and you got to you know, predicate your treatment to that reason. There's no one size fits all with, with pain control. And I think that's what I mean when I talk about personalization of pain. I think that, you know, each person's different as we spoke about the biopsychosocial model. Physiologically, think each person, uh, you know, has, have minor variations, but really the variations introduced both from a psychological and social perspective. And uh, I think that's important to acknowledge and address. Dr. Joe, how do you approach patients who, you know, nothing, no modalities are really working out for them and you can kind of chalk up the pain to be very in that cycle or in the, in the psychosocial kind of bucket um, where it's really just their mind telling them that there's this pain, right? And, you know, a lot of people say it's quote unquote in your head. And when we say that we mean, you know, your brain and that kind of perception that it has, but a lot of patients don't want to hear about, you know, going to go see a pain psychologist. They just want the quick fix. They want the opioid. Um, how, what is your approach to taking patients through that and trying to maybe even convince them that they might need to go through some kind of therapy to at least learn how to manage the pain better? Well, Darsh, you know, the first thing I do when I have one of those patients is make sure I'm not missing anything as an orthopedic surgeon. I, I look more proximal up their kinetic chain. For instance, if they come in with shoulder pain that's completely refractory to care related to their shoulder, I make sure that there's nothing going on with their cervical spine referring to their shoulder. In fact, a huge percentage of my practice is delineating between what's what's actually spine pain and neurogenic pain versus what's organic uh, uh, joint pain. Now, aside from that, when counseling patients, as, as you spoke about, I make sure that all patients that come to, to my clinic really understand why I think PT might benefit them. Uh, because I think providing a prescription without that expl explanation or context uh, uh, will, will really lead to decreased compliance. And just short of that, let's say I, I referred a patient to a mental health expert. I explained that, you know, I, I tried to dispel any stigma uh, related to that. For instance, I might relate their he healing process to that of a professional athlete with a very similar injury. And I find that to be very effective in my practice, and, and it, it really helps boost compliance as well. Perfect. Um, so I know there was also a paper as Altamash was talking about is that you're interested in kind of machine learning and AI 
Do you mind talking a little bit about that and its relation to the opioid risk assessment that you're looking into? Yeah, definitely. So machine learning is interesting because, you know, really for the first time, we can leverage these massive data sets that uh, that we've been accumulating and uh, we can perform new analyses and predictive modeling that haven't really been done before to improve patient care. And we recently did that in the context of uh, meniscus surgery and looking at predictors of decrease of increased, excuse me, opioids after meniscus surgery. And what's interesting is that with machine learning, it really it, it came up with different results as compared to our univariate and multivariate models that, that we were coming up with. And I think this is really exciting because this opens up opportunities for uh, new ways to analyze big data sets, as I spoke about, and implement empiric data-driven medicine uh, that, can really, that can really change care for patients ultimately. Yeah, AI is especially hot right now, right, with the chat GPT going around. Dr. Gupta, we, we recently spoke about this uh, on the podcast. And, you know, a lot of people are, are, are getting nervous, particularly healthcare providers saying that, oh, man, it's going to completely re- replace what it is that we do. But I think that if we truly understand it and we can kind of make medicine so much more efficient than it is, I think all of us here, we're talking offline about uh, it's pretty antiquated in terms of how there are certain things that we do. And it's like, why are we still doing this? For instance, we still fax things to people, right? I mean, you're, you're an academic medicine. I'm an academic medicine um, and, and we're still faxing stuff over to people. And it's just like, I, I don't understand how, how that's happening, right? I can get a mortgage from somebody in Utah and, and buy a house with that respect, but I still have to fax medical records over. So anyways, uh, I, I digress a little there. Um, so so I'm, I'm certainly excited to continue seeing how we're going to leverage AI and, and, and be able to extract all this data and, and, and improve our practices. I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about your your experience with professional athletes, right? You, you trained at Stedman Clinic, and for those who don't, don't know, probably one of the best fellowships in the in the world. Um, and you took care of a lot of Olympic athletes. You took care of professional athletes. And one of the things that, you know, people who take care of pro athletes or really athletes at, at any high level, you realize that the toll that it takes on you uh, physically, mentally, right, emotionally, uh, but really in the sports medicine world, we kind of worry about the the physical toll. Now, for instance, I think I recently had somebody come in who wants to compete at a master's level, right? And he has a labral tear and he's coming to see me with a paralabral cyst and continue to have, an, and his goal was like, I just want to compete one more time next year at the master's level. Can you keep aspirating my cyst? Like, <laughs> well, like now you have edema in your inf- infraspinatus, which is one of the rotator cuff muscles in the back. So you, you have some, some nerve related issues going on. Like this might not be a good idea. That being said, though, we've all see, taken care of that athlete who was like at the back end of their career, maybe LeBron, right? That foot injury is like, I just got to get through one more championship. Uh, but the the price you pay five years from now, 10 years from now, um, uh, it, it can be um, pretty significant. So I'd love to get your thoughts on just that aspect of it, like professional sports, especially those high collision trauma and longevity because that's something that we're so interested in and a lot of people have been talking a lot about. Yeah. So, you know, as you delineated, you know, athletes at the high D level, D one level, which I take care of and professional level really put their bodies to the limit. Uh, for a lot of these athletes, their, their performance is their life, right. And it's their livelihood and it's not their future for not only themselves, but their families, et cetera. Historically, it was the dogma for these athletes to work, 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 and that rest and recovery are really secondary to the work that you put out in the in the court and the field. And and I find it interesting that that a lot of the athletes that I, that I've seen from uh, from probably the generation behind, you know, or a generation or two behind, really have a significant degenerative pathology in their joints, likely because of you know overwork, uh, which is consistent with all athletes as well as, uh, you know, uh, neglecting rest and recovery. And there's many stories of, let's take NBA players who stay up late, uh, wake up early for practice, and then play a game in the evening. And, uh, and I think that the paradigm's kind of changed in this regard. And I'm, I'm happy to see that there's a greater emphasis on rest and recovery in, in today's day and age. Um, and, I, and again, when dealing with high-level athletes, I like to frame injury and prevention to the practices of well-known players like Tom Brady or LeBron James, who you alluded to, who still work hard but have a greater priority on nutrition, technique, treatment, and, and sleep, both in and out of, the, out of the season. And 
in, in doing that, I've seen kind of a shift in the types of injuries these players get, as well as their recovery and regenerative capacity. Are you guys familiar with Gilbert Arenas? Yes. Yeah. So I recently, uh, I don't know if it was on a podcast or on, on um, something on social media or YouTube I was watching. But as you guys know, I think the the old, you know, the the basketball players in the 80s and 90s, there's always a debate like, oh, you know, today's players, the flopping, they wouldn't last in our era and that kind of stuff. And Gilbert Arena had a, uh, Arenas had a really interesting take. You know, he was just talking about how these quote unquote old heads keep talking about how, you know, us in their era wouldn't do well because, you know, what they were doing in that time is they were just kind of hacking you as you were coming down the paint, right? Like those, those Pistons teams, right? Yeah. <laughs> With Michael Jordan coming down, um, uh, Bill and Beer and, and those guys, right? As it was coming out, just taking his head off and, uh, and how now it requires a lot more skill. But what was interesting and relates to your point now is he was talking about how today's players, they take all those things, recoveries, with respect to recovery that you mentioned so seriously, right? They're getting their, their nutrition's on point, their sleep's on point. Whereas 30 years ago, these guys were smoking cigars in the locker room right after. And, 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 you know, and they just, you know, his point was they just wouldn't be able to compete because they can't outlast like 20 years in the NBA, kind of like LeBron is, or, or even the longevity of these, these players. So um, I just thought that was really funny and kind of reminded me of that. Um, But the other thing, you brought up the the degenerative conditions that these athletes have, right? That they sustain, whether it's knee for knees for basketball players, ankles, et cetera. Um, CTE is something that's very popular that everybody knows about concussions, especially with Tua, what happened last season. Um, again, it, it does impact uh, them immediately, but also what their future is going to look like 20 years from, 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 um, from now, right after they're done playing. But then again, musculoskeletal pain as significant it is, uh, chronic pain and addiction to opioids is also a concern, particularly for this population, right? I think athletes at high levels will talk about just, you know, they were getting tortle shots in the locker room just so they can get, get back out there and play. I think Patrick Mahomes had a grade three ankle sprain and play two weeks later. Like every single person who takes care of grade three ankle sprains, we know that there's no, no way that that's healed. You should not be playing. Right. But Super Bowl, got to get out there. Got to do that. Right. Uh, that's, those are decisions you make. Uh, but again, downstream cost to that. What um, has been your experience like with that specific aspect, right? Dealing with the ex-athlete, the quote unquote washed up athlete, and maybe just addiction and, and chronic pain and opioid and just debility with respect to that. Uh, because now you have somebody who has a different mentality, right? It's not your quote unquote person off the street, the average individual. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think that uh, your question here hits upon a number of things. Um, you know, firstly, I'd like to start off with the fact that you know studies have shown that opioid use is very significant among athletes as early as at the high school level, and that you know recent studies have shown that as high as twenty five to fifty percent of high school athletes have reported non using non prescription opioids. Wow! And, and these studies have commented that it's been linked to increased uh, attention on these athletes, publicity, and pressure to perform. And as we know, these behaviors can precip precipitate tolerance and dependence that does not really improve as these, pro as these athletes progress from, from high school to college to professional level. Now, what I can speak about from, from taking care of high-level collegiate athletes is that we really uh, screen our athletes for these substances, and we have a no-tolerance policy, uh, particularly if they're, if they're non-prescription. However, interestingly enough, looking at the generation prior to ours, it was it was not uncommon that athletes would self-medicate, whether it's with an opioid medicine or or marijuana, uh, as it's coming out more and more that many uh, NFL players would would self-medicate with marijuana. And uh, again, it's it's had disastrous consequences uh, in their future because you know these athletes are under such pressure to perform and really will go to any cost to make sure that their performance stays on the field. Um, you know, because their 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 both their future is predicated upon performance, uh, and that they they also kind of damage their their long term health at their joints, and um, it's just a tough thing to deal with. Uh, and you know, the best thing you can do as a medical practitioner is just counsel the athletes and let them know that uh, there's a high level of degeneration, and that they just have to have a plan for sure, and just make sure that uh, all areas of addiction and dependence are addressed. The high school number that, that you cited is surprising to me. 
it makes me wonder that with the new rules of NIL for college and, you know, the implications of somebody getting millions of dollars from their name, image, and likeness, um, if they're going to be more inclined to do this so they can stay on the court, stay on the field, right? I think actually recently there was somebody from Michigan who transferred to somewhere else because he got a lot more money. I forget the basketball player's name. Hunter um, Dickinson, so. I believe. You know, uh, if I were a betting man, I would say that uh, it, this has the potential to get worse and that uh, for those who take care of athletes at this level, you really, I think we have a civic duty to, to pay attention and, and ask our athletes if they're getting access to these and to counsel them as to why it's bad and why that uh, this behavior might have a, a severe detrimental effect in their future and that there's life after sport, of course. Sorry, I was just going to ask, I might have missed this. Are there are there specific policies that are in place when it comes to prescribing? Because I mean, I can only imagine high school level. I mean, that's, you know, your PCP and whatnot. But then when it comes to at least professional athletes, I it's, I don't know, I guess not. Because I mean, it looks like they just have to get on to that next play or the, you know, next game. Yeah, you know, there's certain outlines for, for athletes at the high D level and professional, uh, you know, those most of those are outside the scope of this discussion, but, you know, those athletes are, are forced to comply with certain restrictions uh, placed by the, whether it be the NCAA, NBA, NFL, et cetera. Um, but in some regards, those restrictions are, are very liberal. Um, and in some regards, they're perfectly appropriate. Yep. So, so that begs the question, right? For the sports medicine provider, for the team physician, um, who's going to be in this quote unquote mess, right? As the, the future gets a little bit slippery, what can we do? Um, I put myself in that category as, as a sports medicine provider. What can team physicians do, musculoskeletal providers do uh, to arm themselves to be better informed um, and protect the athletes, right? Sometimes you have to protect the athletes from themselves um, when they're injured or, or you know, even with these types of tricky discussions, especially at the at the level of college and above, right? Where they're all adults, right? They're supposed to make their decisions, right? Patient autonomy. Um, and that gets very tricky. Uh, but what can we do? Uh, so you kind of alluded on this. I think uh, being at the forefront of the literature in this regard and uh, being ambassadors for, for what I would consider the right thing is really where this starts. Um, and, and just know that as a physician or, and someone that takes care of a team, you might face resistance, not not necessarily from the athlete themselves, but maybe even from a parent, a coach. Um, and I think it's important as a sports medicine uh, practitioner to really ally with your athletic trainers and, and teams and and educate them uh, as to why you're making the decisions that you're, ma you're making. Moreover, I, I would recommend that um, as a practitioner, you maintain a low threshold to, to have your athletes consult with mental health specialists, whether, whether that's a social worker or psychologist, uh, uh, particularly if you've identified some problem athletes or athletes that, that um, are, might be prone to some of these activities uh, because this, this might, you might realize that this is a multidisciplinary uh, thing here and that the more help and more hands, so to speak, that you have on board, uh, the better it is for the athlete, which is why we all do what we do. Thank you, Dr. Jill Day. Um, you know, I, I am curious about what's next for you. I don't think you have enough papers under your belt. Um, no, I'm just... <laughs> Just pulling your leg there. Um, I'm sure you got some stuff uh, cooking up, but uh, tell the audience what are what are you most excited about um, in your field, and what do you what do you have going on right now? Yeah, you know, so first and foremost, uh, it's it's always my number one priority to provide world class individualized care and techniques to my patients that come not just from the state of Michigan, but really travel from beyond uh, to seek my own care. Um, you know, as a team physician for MSU Athletics, it's my goal to keep these athletes in top shape and, and winning and, and doing well. So I, I think that that's always a, a huge priority of mine. And then from an academic perspective, I have a huge role in teaching the next generations of physicians as, I, as I'm a professor at both the MD and, and DO school here at MSU, which, which I take very seriously. From a research perspective, um, you know, we've talked a lot about some of my more recent success and and optimizing the patient experience postoperatively. And I, I'd like to really continue that momentum. Um, I'd like to see greater impl implementation of impaired data-driven medicine. And, and I think that there's a huge opportunity to help optimize and refine the indications for biologics out there and, and orthopedic technology for that matter. Very cool. Well, hey, I just want to thank you from, from my perspective. You know, opioid crisis is obviously a big deal. More and more people are hearing about it and you're obviously doing a big part in, in really helping out uh, people understand why uh, it's not necessarily the best thing to grab at, you know, as, as the first thing. Um, 
But tell me a little bit about your practice. If some of the listeners want to maybe get in touch with you, they have some ailments, um, they want to come see you, what should they do? Yeah. So, you know, the easiest way is to go on my website, just jillday.com. It's just my last name, J-I-L-D-E-H. Otherwise, if you Google my name, Tufik Jilday, MD, you should find plenty of links. And if you're interested in my research and, uh, and follow me in that regard, you know, you can always find me in PubMed or ResearchGate or simply just find me on my social media, Instagram and Twitter at Jilday MD. Awesome. Well, last but not least, um, Dr. Jilday, see, as we've been talking about and as clearly what you're doing is, is helping to redefine what medicine is and, and what the future of medicine is. Um, and, and that's kind of what, what our hope and aspiration is with this show is, as well, right? And so something that we talk about is historically and maybe even a little bit now, which we touched on, is we practice a lot of sick care. And instead, what we all want to do, what we all signed up to do is practice health care. So the question becomes is, what does it mean to you or, or how do you think we can put the health back in health care? So that's a great question. I think that as physicians and providers, uh, it's it's important that we always do what's right for the patient and prioritize things and, and keep patients and loved ones in mind, whether it be providing clinical medicine or attacking this from a academic standpoint. You know, my I've had my own personal motivations to to look into pain control from from uh, you know my own family experiences. And, uh, you know, I, I like to think that I can derive motivation from these experiences and help people on a whole. So, uh, you know, to put health back into healthcare, I think it's just important to have your own personal motivations and keep patients number one. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Jose. Thank you, guys. This was really fun. Thanks for listening to another episode of Medicine Redefined. If you want to follow Dr. Jilde or see what he's up to, be sure to check out his work at jilday.com. His website and socials will also be linked in the show notes. As always, Darsh and I are grateful for your support and also want to shout out our team, Ethan Ju and Harita Yopri for making this a worthwhile experience for you. Now, before you sign off, please remember that everything in the podcast is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, nor should it be construed as medical advice. No physician-patient relationship is formed, and anything discussed in this podcast does not represent the views of our employers. We recommend that you seek the guidance of your personal physician regarding any specific health-related issues. However, if you enjoy the show, please be sure to subscribe, review, and share it with anyone who you think will gain value from this. And until next time, thank you for listening. Thank you.